Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, a concerning look into the quarantine hotels for returning travelers. I feel that I've been extorted and falsely imprisoned under the guise of public safety and public health. Reports of crowded waiting areas and a lack of basic necessities. I must have tried at least a couple, couple of hundred times to uh, call someone. Canadians are making their post-vaccine plans. It is this excitement that the normalcy is in the horizon. So can you see your grandkids after you get your shot? Making connections between generations. Oh, you're tall. I didn't know that. A program to alleviate loneliness for both seniors and teens. And does your Zoom presence need a little boost? Instead of a power suit, you have power art. Oh, I like that. An unexpected surge in art sales. This is The National. If you're going to travel outside the country, you know the rules when you return. Mandatory quarantine at a designated hotel at your own expense until a COVID-19 test comes back negative. It's supposed to be expensive and inconvenient, but in the first few days, travelers say it's more than that. Reports of delays, conditions that don't seem COVID safe, food hard to come by. Talia Ricci shows us how travelers may have been ready to meet the requirements, but government authorized hotels may not have been ready for them. To book this hotel was a six hour, uh, six hour phone call. Guests of Toronto's quarantine hotels say their problems began before they even checked in. I spoke to a few people and they said that the check in is at 3 p.m. And it was like 10.30 a.m. at that point. We want to the But it was what they experienced when they arrived that shocked them most, including being asked to wait in rooms with dozens of other travelers. Sarah Vinero was returning from her teaching job in South Korea. I've interacted at that point with more than 50 people. Um, so what, what was the point? If I had just gotten a car at the airport, I could have driven to where I was going to do quarantine originally, and I would have had to interact with maybe one additional person. Vinero was a guest here, one of 11 hotels designated as mandatory accommodations in the Toronto area. At others, there were also complaints about access to food. I waited till 10.30 very, very patiently so that for my dinner, but it never showed up. It seems criminal to, to actually expect people to, to, to pay this. I must have tried at least a couple, couple of hundred times uh, to try and you know call someone, get someone on the phone. Eventually I had to go downstairs just to talk to someone and that's where there were also several other uh, guests that were there extremely frustrated. They had not gotten any food. They had not gotten any water. I understand that. And okay. not that Other guests shared similar stories on social media. A knowledgeable hotel industry source told CBC News that the main issue is too many guests. The volume of travelers several times higher than expected. In a statement, the Public Health Agency of Canada says it's in daily contact with hotels to support them, and that government employees and security are stationed at the hotels to enforce safety measures. I feel that I've been extorted and falsely imprisoned under the guise of public safety and public health. Vinero says if she could do it again, she'd take the fine and quarantine on her own. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Across the country, as new COVID outbreaks are reported, some areas are shutting down. Today, another 2,300 confirmed cases were added to the national total, which sits at more than 866,000. Nearly a third of those are from Ontario, which today surpassed 300,000 cases. Those climbing numbers may be discouraging, but then there's this. The number of vaccine doses administered to Canadians is closing in on 2 million, with more than 500,000 people now considered fully vaccinated, having received their second shots. Every vaccine given is seen as another step towards ending this pandemic. But as Ashley Burke explains, even as some areas struggle to contain cases, not everyone wants the first shot they can get. Less than two weeks after they opened, Ontario was pulling the emergency break for two regions, reimposing COVID restrictions as cases rise. And it's not alone. Until we are able to confirm otherwise, we need to act as if this is the variant. For the next 72 hours, PEI is closing schools, banning personal gatherings, and expecting people to stay home as a cluster of cases grows. It is quicker uh, to go, uh, harder, faster, uh, and that will give us better outcomes in the end. 
hopes are pinned on COVID vaccines, but the prime minister told NBC's Meet the Press the rollout isn't going as quickly as he had hoped. Obviously, uh, it's not going as fast as, uh, as everyone would want. We all want this pandemic to be over yesterday and to vaccinate everyone as quickly as possible. Uh, but we're confident that in the coming weeks, hundreds of thousands uh, uh, vaccines every week, millions uh, into the coming months, uh, we are going to have everyone vaccinated uh, probably by the end of the summer. Helping with that, the newly approved AstraZeneca vaccine. Half a million doses are scheduled to arrive Wednesday, but with new options, a new problem. We're starting to see a little bit of a narrative of good vaccines and bad vaccines. There really, you know, there really isn't that sort of that delineation. Some Canadians talking about waiting to get the vaccine so they can choose which shot they want. This after hearing AstraZeneca is about 62% effective, whereas Moderna and Pfizer more than 90%. You can't really compare. But Dr. Supriya Sharma told Rosemary Barton Live, you can't compare trials done at different times and stress the best vaccine is the one you can get. When we look across all the vaccines, the major five that are under review and authorized, if you look at that subsection, as we said, that matters most, so severe disease, hospitalizations, uh, dying of COVID-19, all of these vaccines are, are equally protective. She says the longer people sit back and wait unprotected, the longer this will all drag on. And Ashley, we may be getting another vaccine here soon. Exactly, and Health Canada is pouring over new manufacturing data today from Johnson & Johnson. The health agency received the information yesterday on the same day the FDA approved the vaccine in the U.S. Now, Canada is expected to decide if it will be approved in the next couple of weeks. And if that happens, it would be the first single-shot vaccine in Canada. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. And as the vaccine supply grows, many Canadians are now asking when life can go back to normal. But experts say a lot can happen between now and the summer, and they want Canadians to stay on guard. Lauren Pelly shows us why. The do the nose thing? Yeah, can you so do so this? You can do you remember that? that? For Dr. Tally Bogler, this is family time with her parents. No hugs just yet, only virtual visits. Even though as a family physician, she is now fully vaccinated. There's this real strong desire to be able to reconnect with the people that we love. And it hurts me to see, you know, this year has gone by for my parents not being able to be with those that they love. And it's, it's really hard. But Bogler says for now, this is the safest approach, since her parents could be waiting months for their shots. We need more people to be vaccinated, obviously, in our public to be able to lift public health restrictions. That's the message from most medical experts, that masking, distancing and other precautions should remain in place for some time while millions of Canadians remain vulnerable. The bottom line is nothing changes quickly. Still, shots in arms are ramping up across the country and people will likely make their own private decisions about when to start seeing each other. If your parents are, are older and they've gotten vaccinated and you're vaccinated, what's the harm of the visit? The harm is probably quite low. These vaccines are proving highly effective at preventing serious illness and death, but it's worth keeping in mind they don't protect you instantly and might not prevent you from carrying the virus without knowing it. So what we want to do here is, you know, you, you can't jump ahead of the gun and say, OK, you got a vaccine, you go back to normal and you didn't get a vaccine. So you just wait, because the reality is that those people who got vaccines could still be transmitting to those who didn't. That's why for many of those vaccinated, life isn't back to normal, but it's getting closer. It is this excitement that, you know, the, the normalcy is, you know, in the horizon. And as Bogler says, this transition period won't last forever. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. One out of every five Canadian deaths from COVID-19 happened in Ontario's long-term care homes. And the minister responsible for those homes hasn't faced sustained questioning about it until now. Ontario's Minister of Long-Term Care, Dr. Mary Lee Fullerton, and her deputy appeared before a commission looking into how the province handled the crisis. Transcripts of that testimony were released this evening. David Common has been reviewing them. And, and David, what do they reveal? So, Ian, if we go back to those early days, it's clear the province did not have a clearly articulated plan on what to do. It was emphasizing hospitals, not long-term care homes, and also didn't recognize asymptomatic spread, in spite of what was happening on, like, the Diamond Princess cruise ship, for instance. As the deaths start to mount, there is concern, 
and the minister uh, in mid-April saying, look, we got to get the military into this one home, Orchard Villa, where a lot of people are dying. Get them in within 24 or 48 hours. But it takes the province four more days just to ask for the soldiers to go in, five days after that for the soldiers to actually go in. Now, more people, David, died in the, the second wave in Ontario homes than the first. Any explanation for that? Yeah, and that second wave still ongoing, of course, Ian. The minister blaming community spread. She denies it has anything to do with actions taken or not taken by her government. Lots of talk around funding. You know, some regions are actually adding money to what the province gives them for long-term care homes so they can buy things like fresh fruit and veg for the seniors who live in them. And then there's the question of inspections. This government canceled the most comprehensive of inspections before COVID struck. The minister really downplaying the importance of inspections in her testimony to the commission. Thanks, David. COVID-19 has forced the NBA to postpone Toronto's game against Chicago tonight. The league said due to positive test results and contact tracing issues, the Raptors didn't have the league required eight players available for tonight's game against the Bulls. Star player Pascal Siakam, head coach Nick Nurse, and five other coaching staff members were forced to miss the team's game on Friday due to health protocols. It remains unclear how many have tested positive within the organization. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo addressed sexual harassment claims against him tonight, apologizing for past behavior while denying misconduct. Two female former staffers claim the Cuomo asked them sexually inappropriate questions. One also says that he kissed her without consent. In a statement, Governor Cuomo apologized for comments that he said were, quote, misinterpreted as unwanted flirtation. Donald Trump has returned to the spotlight tonight, making his first public appearance since leaving the Oval Office, hinting at a 2024 run and hitting back at his opponents. Katie Simpson is watching that. He's been out of office for just over a month now, and that time away appears to have changed little about the former president. We have a very sick and corrupt electoral process that must be fixed immediately. This election was rigged, and the Supreme Court and other courts didn't want to do anything about it. Donald Trump used his speech at a friendly conservative conference to repeat the lie the election was stolen. And while he vowed revenge against Republicans who supported impeachment, he denied he has plans to start a new party. We have the Republican Party. It's going to unite and be stronger than ever before. I am not starting a new party. But much of Trump's focus centered around divisive issues and fears that stoke his base. Immigration, cancel culture, and now transgender athletes. Young girls and women are incensed that they are now being forced to compete against those who are biological males. Trump flirted with running again in 2024, and this weekend-long gathering is a glimpse into what the Republican Party may look like if Trump remains at the helm. You know, on January the 6th, I objected during the Electoral College certification. Maybe you heard about it. Only staunch Trump allies were invited to the main stage, and on the sidelines, there was this. A faux gold statue in Trump's likeness, one of the more popular kiosks at the conference. Congress, the Republicans in Congress, they better uh, get with him and stand with him or they're going to be out on the outside looking in. There are just a few Republicans right now willing to publicly disagree with Trump and his supporters. And there are fears it will lead to long-term losses if there's not an honest assessment of the last campaign. If we idolize one person, we will lose. And that's kind of clear from the last election. So, Katie, what does a speech like this from Trump do for the party? Well, it's going to make it harder for Republicans to come together and unite. Trump wants to establish that he is the future of the party, whether he's really up for running again in 2024 or not. And as long as Republicans are fighting amongst themselves, it takes energy and time away from their ability to take on their political opponents. And, Ian, internal fights are almost always worse than attacks from the outside. Thanks, Katie. Thanks. While Republicans rally around the former U.S. president, the world is dealing with the current administration. Rosemary Barton got a chance to speak with America's top diplomat, Anthony Blinken. In his first Canadian interview as Secretary of State, he gave us a sense of Joe Biden's approach to Canada. 
Anthony Blinken, our Secretary of State, sitting here. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken spent some of last week visiting Canada virtually. It's part of President Biden's agenda to rebuild the relationship between the U.S. and this country. So thank you again, Mr. Prime Minister, for your partnership. It was full of kind words and smiles. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. But there are also potential points of friction, like Canada's hope for more vaccines to come directly from the U.S. instead of Europe. The Americans are vaccinating their population at a rate of about 1.7 million people a day. Canada has given just over 1.7 million to its whole population. But in an exclusive interview with CBC News, Blinken wouldn't make any promises. Well, we're working on a framework uh, right now for how we can uh, maximize the availability of, uh, of vaccines. Of course, we're focused uh, on getting every, uh, every American vaccinated. One of President Biden's first moves was to strengthen Buy American provisions. Canada has been told it will be consulted on those measures, and while Blinken was reassuring, he provided no guarantees. We already have this incredibly uh, vibrant relationship uh, that I'm convinced, particularly given some of the new imperatives on supply chains and bouncing back and building back better from COVID-19, where we are such natural uh, partners. Policy and positions between Ottawa and Washington are now closely aligned, but Canada is hoping the U.S. will be able to finally make a difference when it comes to China and the arbitrary detention of Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. We stand strongly with Canada when it comes uh, to the need to see the two Michaels released immediately uh, and unconditionally. That could also include actions led by the U.S. on what the White House has called genocide against the Uyghur population in China. The motion as amended carried. While Parliament agrees with that conclusion, the Liberal cabinet has refused to go that far. Blinken says that declaration is up to each country, but... It's a lot harder for China to ignore our collective voice and our collective weight. So I think there is, um, there's, there, there's power in, uh, in numbers. Blinken also made it clear the United States is a friend of Canada and is willing to help when it can. And the Biden administration is committed to re-engaging with the world, even if there are disagreements with friends along the way. Merci, mon ami. Thank you, Justin. Rosemary Barton, CBC News, Ottawa. Turning now to the worsening situation in Myanmar, at least 18 people were reported killed today as protests against the military coup intensify and security forces crack down. Stephanie Mercier looks at that tonight. It's being called the bloodiest day of the protests this year. Police firing at protesters in cities across Myanmar, including this southeastern city where they took shots at citizens from the back of a truck. In the Yangon, protesters battled police with Molotov cocktails. Images show several injured people being helped away. Crowds have been out in the streets of Myanmar for weeks, civil servants refusing to work, protesting the military's takeover of the country on February 1st and demanding the release of Aung San Suu Kyi. Her National League for Democracy party was elected in the fall in a landslide, seen as another step in Myanmar's slow road to democracy after 50 years of military rule until the army detained her along with other government members on accusations of election fraud. Suchi is expected to make her next court appearance on Monday. In the meantime, protests continue. Former Ontario cabinet minister Monique Smith spent time with a democracy building organization in Myanmar before COVID struck. People have really had a taste of freedom and uh, have experienced democracy and they don't want to go back. Um, the military sees that and I think has been uh, somewhat taken aback by the response of the civilian population. In the face of determined resistance, the military is now cracking down even harder. The Canadian Embassy condemned the crackdown by security forces and issued this statement, calling on the military and police to refrain from and to cease immediately all attacks, intimidation and threats against protesters and to release those detained. Demands echoed by thousands in the streets. Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. What happens when a telecom contractor damages your property on the job? I felt like they're putting me off uh, to wear me down. Next, go public investigation. Why fighting for compensation is so difficult.
bringing generations together to ease pandemic loneliness. I love and look forward to getting to talk to her each and every week. She spends a whole hour with me and it has filled an empty spot. Plus, expert tips on how to feel more connected. And a surprising new trend, curating for your Zoom calls. Instead of a power suit, you have power art. Oh, I like that. What's in your background? We'll be right back. Welcome back. An Ontario man is going public tonight with his battle to get compensation from Bell Canada and its contractor over damage to his car. As Go Public's Rosa Marcatelli shows us, his story is raising questions over how telecom giants are dealing with customer complaints. There are the right tools for washing a car. And then there's this one, a hydrovac used for digging holes in the ground to install things like fiber optic lines for internet service. A Bell contractor employee was doing just that when he accidentally got mud on David Rooney's car and then used the hydrovac to clean it, peeling the paint right off. I was quite surprised. I mean, he's obviously, you know, familiar with the tool. He does it all the time and must realize that, you know, you can't use that tool on, on a car. $1,500 worth of damage was done. Rooney figured getting compensation would be simple. Instead, he found himself fighting Bell and its contractor, a company called Super Sucker Hydrovac. Neither would pay up. I really came to a point in time where I felt like they're putting me off. Uh, to wear me down. It wasn't until Go Public contacted both companies that Super Sucker finally gave Rooney his money. But in many cases, getting compensation can be tough, says this consumer advocate. There's a very low likelihood of getting any money back if the company or the, the telco resists paying you. That's because the mediator of telecoms, the CCTS, doesn't deal with property damage complaints, only service-related ones, leaving court action as the only option. Lawford says legally both Bell and its contractors are potentially liable, but... Is this really a, a conversation we should be having about which, which person catches the hot potato? Shouldn't it be the uh, consumer getting redressed for something that it doesn't really matter whose fault, strictly speaking, um, legally it is. Super Sucker blames the insurance companies on both sides, saying this is not a matter that should be handled by anyone internally or by Mr. Rooney himself. Bell blames Super Sucker, saying there was a serious issue with communication from our contractor and we have addressed the incident with them. The solution is simple, says Lawford. Expand the mandate of the CCTS to deal with property damage complaints. Rooney says that sure would have made things a lot easier for him. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Go Public. And a reminder, our Go Public stories come from you. So if you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Fans of the successful Canadian cosmetic company, Decium, are concerned about its future after its $2 billion takeover. The Toronto-based cosmetics company quickly became a favorite with consumers around the world. But as Diane Buckner shows us, its acquisition by the beauty giant Estee Lauder has many worried that change is coming. The name of Decium's store says it all, the abnormal beauty company. Founded in Toronto in 2013, Decium isn't normal. Unlike most big skincare brands, it sells formulations with just a few ingredients at exceptionally low prices. It's unheard of to get a retinoid for $13. They've got a really popular hyaluronic acid and niacinamide and all under 20 bucks. The company did half a billion dollars in sales last year. A new beginning. No wonder New York-based beauty giant Estee Lauder wanted to take over Decium. I think they liked what they saw in terms of their creativity, the vision. The company's co-founder and CEO says the new owners intend to keep headquarters and jobs in Canada. So they very much want us to retain our independence, which I think is music to our ears. All this talk about, you know, we're selling out, but it's going to be remain independent and they're not going to control us and the big corporate giant is not going to tell us what to do. It's all very cute to say, but it's not true. This business strategist says big corporations only buy smaller ones in order to control them. But that doesn't mean there are always big changes. It's in Estee Lauder's 
interest to maintain the story of the brand because again if they have a portfolio of brands they want one brand like this and one brand like that and one brand like that so they can cater to a wide range of consumers you deserve skincare that works even so beauty insiders point to a popular independent brand similar to desium called paula's choice it changed radically after it was bought by a private equity firm we saw that the prices just skyrocket and then we saw a whole bunch of new products and so people keep citing, oh, I hope this is not another Paula's choice. It's not abnormal for some things to change under new ownership, but it may make business sense for Estee Lauder to not mess with this brand's success. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. It was another winning night for a Canadian comedy powerhouse. And the Golden Globe goes to... Oh, girl. Mm -hmm. Shit's Creek! <laughs> The program getting another award this time at the Golden Globes for the best television series, musical or comedy, and it wasn't the show's only award tonight. Catherine O'Hara named the best actress in a musical or comedy, amazingly, O'Hara's first career Golden Globe. Next, easing that lonely feeling during the pandemic. She takes her time and spends a whole hour with me, and it has filled an empty spot. The life-changing program bringing teens and seniors together. Plus. Now this is very Canadiana in a very way. Very like, Canadiana, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes. Georgian Bay. Are you looking to upgrade your Zoom background? The new trend that's caught the art world by surprise. Even with all the hardship during this pandemic, there can be ways to make things better. And that's where we're heading with this story. It's about a group in B.C. that set out to connect young people with seniors dealing with loneliness and isolation. As Anita Bath shows us, it hasn't just led to conversation. It's been changing lives. Well, that's me. 99 years of life experience. Myrtle McDonald is a former nurse who has spent much of her life teaching and helping vulnerable people around the world. I've got to show you these. But at home in Chilliwack, outside Vancouver, she still managed to be active in her community until COVID hit. My grandchildren are all either in Saskatchewan or in um, Montreal or near there. And uh, so I'm lonely for them. And on top of the pandemic, generational differences often keep seniors and youth apart. Uh, one phrase, people, you, you know, you answer in half sentences. But when the opportunity came up to be paired with a local high school student for weekly chats, she was pleasantly surprised. Oh, she takes her time and spends a whole hour with me and it has filled an empty spot. No text messages, no Zoom. They've developed a bond the old-fashioned way, through phone calls. I'm looking forward to meeting her. I haven't seen her yet. Until today. Hi. Are you Jen? I am. Oh, you're tall. I didn't know that. <laughs> a quick COVID-style meetup. Do I look at all like you expected? You look very young, I must say. Oh. <laughs> Outside, six feet apart, masked, but just enough time for McDonald to poke a little fun at the 17-year-old. Uh, ripped jeans are the most typical for your age group. <laughs> at least they only have two rips. The jokes say it all. The two get along famously. I love and look forward to getting to talk to her each and every week. I just found her more interested and less in a hurry than I expected. Jaylin and Myrtle came together through a community group. Talking to her has made me realize that it's not just that. I don't have to limit myself to doing one thing. I can do it all. I can travel. I can have a career. A similar eye-opening experience for the other 47 youth connected with 53 seniors. I have a 94-year-old man who's connected with a 16-year-old young man, and um, he's writing his memoir for him. And so, you know, the 16-year-old is just saying it's amazing, all the stories. The program is so popular, they've had to turn away applicants. It'll be different once COVID's over because then it won't be as much, you know, need for the telephone for a lot of people. But uh, definitely, you know, we want to keep the intergenerational aspect going. That'll be no problem for these two, whose friendship has only just begun. A bright spot in a dark pandemic. Anita Bath, CBC News, Chilliwack.
So let's continue that theme, reducing loneliness during a pandemic. Joining us now, Dr. Jackie Kinley, a psychiatrist who also teaches at Dalhousie University's Medical School in Halifax, and Riaz Medji. He was a broadcaster and now the author of the new book, Every Conversation Counts, where he helps people overcome loneliness and build deeper relationships with others. Thanks to both of you for being here. And Dr. Kinley, first to you, your reaction to, to that story. Well, first of all, I was just I was just saying, you know, I find just Myrtle's story is very touching. She's she's kind. She's caring. You can really feel the you know, she 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 wants to attach. And I don't think her story is a is a is a sort of singular one. It really speaks to the hunger uh, of, of, of the number of people that want to sign up for this program, which is so fabulous and how it bridges those differences. You know, we make assumptions about other people, appearances sort of at face level, you know, just the conversation about, you know, the genes. And I just thought it was so touching. I mean, I think. Um, giving folks an opportunity to, to recognize that they're 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 more similar than they are different, and we all need the the connection. We need the warmth. We need the belonging. I I, I just thought it was a beautiful story. Yeah, and, and of course, loneliness is not just something that seniors are are dealing with. I want to play a couple of clips from some younger viewers. What they had to say. It's just become increasingly difficult to distract myself. Um, from how lonely I am, um, you know, when it comes down to like a day or a week, that's easy. But when you're talking about months or maybe longer than that, it just wears on you. I am typically somebody who loves staying home, but this year has certainly been a different experience. I miss connecting with people in real life. I live alone and I'm experiencing a new university program studying virtually from home. Video chats are really good substitute, but they're no replacement for the actual live connection. Mm -hmm. Riaz, you've been helping people overcome loneliness before the pandemic, but, but, but since it began, how have things changed? I'm really glad you brought in, Ian, the, the younger demographic and the focus here. I mean, the health research firm Cigna focused on the fact Generation Z, age 18 to 23, is the loneliest generation in America. And there's this great paradox with loneliness that many of us can experience it, yet many of us experience it alone because we feel shame. We feel embarrassment, and it's so important. If there's one silver lining of the pandemic, it's being open with this vulnerability that we're feeling it, so then we can find ways to work through it. Dr. Kinley, mm -hmm. I see you nodding through all of that. Why don't you jump mm -hmm. in? Well, you know, um, I think that sort of this generation, I think it's so true, is that connecting with other people is paramount for them. They learn through their peers, they connect, they grow. It's not just the physical, con you know, it's, it, it's the emotional energy that says, that nurtures us, right? And so I think this generation in particular, you know, it's, it's a generation of hope. They're young, they want to connect, they want to reach out. And I think a lot of them feel ripped off. I not only hear the anger and the frustration, I feel the sadness and the fear. Um, and, 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 and I think this generation has, first, even before COVID, the environmental angst and all of the things that they were feeling, um, this is very, very difficult for them. A big question to both of you, and I'm only going to give you each a minute to answer it. Uh, oh. Riaz, I'll, I'll begin with you. Uh, advice for people who may be watching this at home, feeling lonely, wondering how they can address it. Two things that stand out. One, if we're using technology, creation over consumption. How we can use technology to create more face-to-face -face instead of passively eavesdropping or mindless scrolling on social media feeds that can alienate us or lead to a sense of inadequacy. And if we're creating that face-to-face, -face, and right now we rely on video, this will amplify the level of emotion. That's what we need now, these emotional check-ins of what are you grateful for? What's the experience that taught you something this week? What are you looking forward to? These are the types of check-ins that are going to help lift people up. Dr. Kinley? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I would also say that it's not just about connecting with others, but it's about connecting with oneself. And I really do think that we sort of live in a generation where we've lost touch with ourselves, with our kind of moral compass and our purpose and, and all kinds of things. And, and, and the capacity to be alone is the capacity to be with oneself. And, I, you know, Riaz spoke to shame. I think there's so much. Am I not worthy? Why don't people want to be, what's the future going to be like? I think people get caught in these traps. And, and, and I think kindness, compassion, passion, not just to others, but to oneself, uh, is so important, getting to know oneself. And Dr. Kinley, what about the connection between loneliness and mental health? What are you seeing? 
Well, you know what? It's not the cutoff, I think, that is the issue. It's not the loneliness. It's the reaction to it. So loneliness in and of itself makes one feel empty and sort of lost. But it's when people get angry, when people get scared, when people get sad. You know, the anger is the suspiciousness and all of that kind of stuff. The fear leads to anxiety and the sadness leads to depression. It's not being able to deal with the emotions that are associated with the loneliness that causes the difficulty. So it's the emotional capacity. People are having a trouble grieving. They're having a trouble working through their feelings. And that's why we're having so much difficulty. Loneliness in and of itself is one thing. It shouldn't necessarily drive symptoms. The fact we're, dri we're seeing symptoms is because people can't deal with the emotions that are coming as a result of feeling cut off. Well, really nice talking to both of you. And I should say, before we did the interview, Dr. Kinley said she read <laughs> Riaz's book just yesterday, Every Conversation Counts, and gave it two thumbs up. So that's a pretty good uh, endorsement. <laughs> Thanks to both of you. It's very Thanks, good. Thanks, doctor. I'll take that. Thanks. Yeah, it's thank nice you. to meet you. You as well. When it comes to the pandemic's impact, we often talk about numbers, but we've been bringing you some of the stories of the people who have died as told by their loved ones. Tonight, a woman remembers the aunt she lost three and a half months ago. My name is Rhonda Head. I'm from a Pasquarac Cree Nation. My aunt, Cecilia Head, passed away on November 10, 2020, at the age of 66. A community member has passed away due to COVID-19. Growing up, there was a lot, a lot of us used to gather and just play and hang out. And she was a teenager back then. Uh, they would be standing around on the side and. And I remember her just being really friendly to all the kids that were there. She had a really kind aura. That's that's what I remember about her. She has a son, uh, Arlen Bloomfield. He would want the um, people to know that she was a really beautiful, friendly, kind lady. Her and my uncle got together when they were older. And when they got together, it was just like a, a, a total romantic, true love story. They were inseparable, and, and and they stayed together till you know till death do us do us part. And she was fluent in Cree, and that's a real rare thing for us Indigenous people because of residential school. But she maintained her language and spoke Cree fluently, and that that's one of the traits that I remember about her. Oh, there's no word for goodbye in the Cree language. Kisagitin means I love you, and kitang kewapitin means I will see you again. Kichi nipahimi. Cecilia Head is just one of nearly 22,000 people in Canada lost to COVID-19. And we've been telling many of their stories through our interactive website. You can check it out at cbc.ca slash remembered. The pandemic has changed how a lot of people work. And for some, that is good news. Some of your art is now beginning to hang in the backgrounds of calls like this. It's crazy. Next, the new must-have accessory for all your Zoom calls. Welcome back. Most small businesses haven't seen a boom in sales during the pandemic, but as people are told to lock down, work from home and meet virtually, a small Ontario gallery has switched focus and found a way to flourish by helping those stuck at home make their next Zoom call a little more appealing. David Common explains. In normal times, Collingwood would be bustling with tourist traffic winter and summer. Not so much now. So you might assume this small art gallery would be suffering, art not selling. Okay, perfect. Well, think again. Really? Yeah. yeah. I would say uh, many of our artists have had their best year ever, at least with us. Suzanne Steves and Andrea Ronaldo yeah. run the Butter Gallery. Their business is booming. Liam needs to go up. That itself is a boon for the yeah, local artists they sell for. So what's happened is that people are at home, they're standing, they're looking at these four walls now, they're not traveling, so they have that money to put aside for something that they've been thinking about for a long time. And the other thing that we've kind of introduced to the community and to our clients is the idea of Zoom art. 
um, because a lot of times people are finally looking at what's behind them as they stare on, you know, at their screen, and they don't like what they see. With art starting at $45, they have an array of customers. No need for it to be pricey to brighten a room. Helen, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. Well, thank you, David. So that's the art. That is the painting, indeed. Helen Stucater is a director of sales, needed something she felt to prompt conversations. In my world, I'm very used to being face to face with my clients, entertaining them, uh, whining and dining and having those, those opportunities to really build a relationship. And if it's just a boring gray wall or a white wall behind me, it, it, it doesn't have the same effect. Take a good look at what she selected. It was painted by this woman, artist and sick kids hospital nurse, Grace Afonso. What does it mean for you to know that um, some of your art is now beginning to hang in the backgrounds of calls like this? It's crazy. I, I really insane that uh, that many people enjoy my work and it's kind of so much fun for tons of people to be out there seeing it and sharing it. Grace is delighted. More people will see her work, even if virtually. I kind of thought with COVID, everything for art would kind of die down and it would just be quiet time for us artists in the studio just to paint. I didn't expect uh, everybody to be so interested in, in what we're doing right now. Now, this is very Canadiana in a very way. Very like, Canadiana, yeah. 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 Yes. Georgian Bay. Very Georgian Bay. Yeah. Sweat pine. So how do you pick? That time for me to find out. Something completely different. Fun. So instead of a power suit, you have power art. Oh, I like that. This is exactly how clients are choosing Zoom art with Andrea and Suzanne. But that's a statement for sure. <laughs> now, what would this statement be? Oh, I think it's power, a, yeah, power, power. Art. Powerful animals. Lots to consider, too. Is it too distracting for the people who are viewing you. Are they going to be paying attention to what you're saying or are they going to be focusing on the art? Right. And that, they say, is the key. What is the message you want to project? And it's a very masculine piece as well. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, there's still one more. Okay. So here's a completely inappropriate. Why do you say that? Because the gatherings. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. the they people be, gathering. What if we, could we paint mass onto them? <laughs> that one? Yeah. This one? Okay, you take that and I'll try and find the lorry. Suzanne and Andrea know not everyone can or will be buying art. We have a look. Yet they're committed to making it more accessible. Mm, they're prolific, see. posting to social media, showing off Ooh, their oh, rapidly revolving oh, collection, yeah. helping to connect with a wider audience. Sold. Anything to bring a little color to what have often seemed some pretty dark days. David Common, CBC News, Collingwood, Ontario. I like the art behind me right now. Coming up, another gallery, this one in Winnipeg. I was trying to change the art industry to welcome more diverse artists. Black, Indigenous and people of colour have a new gallery to showcase their stories and art in Winnipeg. The Take Home BIPOC Art House was created to provide a space where artists are in control. The gallery provides low-cost supplies, work studios and mentorship and its mission is our moment. BIPOC Arts House is a space of nourishment. It's a space of healing, it's a space of community. It's not an institution. We're a home, a home for your art, a home for BIPOC peoples to gather and edify each other and grow in their crafts. Our dream with this space is that eventually it'll be just a free studio for Black, Indigenous and artists of colour in Winnipeg. So a space that people can create but also just chill out and have conversations and just meet new people and meet new artists. Some of the things that have created a need for this space are how wildly undervalued BIPOC artists are. We really wanted to create a space where artists could come and like learn and rediscover what their value is. Like you're not in a stranger's house. You're able to instantly feel at ease when you come in because this is yours, because we exist for you. And we thought of you in 
every like in every aspect of how we operate. A gallery opening is ambitious anytime, but imagine during a pandemic and appointments uh, are required before you visit. If you missed Cross Country Checkup earlier today, by the way, we have a new 60-minute podcast version that's been posted. That is the National for February the 28th. Good night.